you please turn with me to the 55th chapter of Isaiah, please. I want to pray and then I want to read from the 6th and 7th verses. Our Father in Jesus' precious name, we would come to thee for the simple reason there just isn't any other way to come to thee. We're so pleased tonight and grateful that he made a way for us, that there is a mediator between man and God, Christ Jesus. And in his blessed name, dear Father, may you have your Holy Spirit come to the side of each and every one of us <laughs> to think, to shut out all truant thoughts. May your blessed Spirit come to our side and help us. Enlighten our minds to the greatest fact of all history that Jesus Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, was buried and rose again, was seen among men. We thank you, Father, for a gospel that can make a, us who are ignorant of your ways. You say, though a man be a wayfaring fool, he can find a way of salvation if he'll apply his mind to it. Help us, we pray, and I thank you for everyone that's here. In Jesus' name, I thank you. Amen. Isaiah 55, 6 and 7, because I'm going to speak on this topic tonight. I'm going to take some from the Old Testament, some from the New Testament. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. My, what two wonderful verses. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. You can only do that, my friends, while you're alive. You can't do it after you're dead. The Bible says, but the dead person, whoever he or she may be, let the unrighteous be unrighteous still, and let the filthy be filthy still, but let the righteous be righteous and the holy be holy still. You know, 10 billion years after we die, we'll have, the same moral disposition as we had when we died. There'll be no changes. I admit there'll be improvements in our knowledge. But some of us think, well, I love sin here. When I get to heaven, I won't love it. You sure won't. It won't be there. Because anything that defileth is not going to enter in. And this subject I'm going to speak to you tonight, the atonement of our blessed Lord, is the only way through which we can enter into God's presence and in his marvelous home up there or even walk with him right down here. So he says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. I'm going to speak to you tonight on why Christ died for our sins. And certainly he did. In the late 1950s, I can't remember whether it was Life or Time magazine, but they sent an inquiry to the 100 most prominent people in the United States, and they asked them to list for them the 25 most important events of all history. I don't know what you think is the most important event of all history, but I have certainly had that settled in my mind now for quite a few decades. To me, the greatest fact of all history is not what I heard a person on our Christian radio program at Christmas time, he's saying it. The greatest thing that ever happened on the earth was for Jesus to be born here. No, it isn't, and no, it wasn't. 
because if he hadn't died for our sins, it would have meant nothing. Am I correct? And Jesus Christ came into the world to die for sinners. Simple reason being that man is separated from God. He's loose from God. When God said to Adam and Eve, the soul that sinneth it shall die, that word die or death there means he'll be separated from him. He's loose from him. You're not going to live in sin and walk with him here. So if you want to walk with God and with Christ here, you must come to him in faith and put your faith and trust in his shed blood that he shed for you and for me on Calvary's cross to make it possible for us to be forgiven and and transformed. Now, everybody wants to be forgiven. Who wants to be transformed? I'm sorry to say, very few. Now, where would the death of Christ come in on that list of the 100 or the 25 most important events of history? What would you have said? Well, where do you think it came in on these 100 most prominent people in the United States? The death of Christ. Where do you think it came in when you average them out? Somebody want to guess? Doesn't cost anything. <laughs> 15? Anybody give me 20? Didn't come in. How about five? How about 10? Young lady back here had it correctly. Fourteenth. The most important event of all history, in my estimation, a lot smarter men than me would agree with it, that it's the most important event of all history. It's the least understood. It's the most misunderstood. And the least appreciated, that's for sure, among most people. That Jesus Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, was buried and rose again and was seen among men. Now, friends, when you begin to study this subject, and I'll tell you, quite a few decades ago, the Spirit of God seemed to impress upon me. I had been diligent in studying for my secular work. And one of the reasons I was diligent was because I spoke before a lot of scientific societies. And I would start off by giving my witness of the saving grace of Christ. Otherwise, I couldn't figure out any other reason why the Lord would ever direct me in front of such people. Of course, he loves the scientists too. When it says not many wise, not many noble are called, it isn't that God doesn't love scientists or he doesn't love the noble, but the noble won't buy a lot of these filly, selfish, stupid presentations of the gospel. And I believe, and I believe with all my heart, every man's got a right in this world to hear an intelligent presentation of the gospel. I'm certain that Jesus would want that. Some of the emasculated things that I heard almost monthly, make me want to lay down on the floor and cry like a little kid. Because you see, there's one thing worse than making something too complicated. That is oversimplify it. Because when you oversimplify it, you leave out the essence. And the average person doesn't have the time nor the ability to do the research and go back and find out the real elements and the real essence of it. So they miss it. So I'd rather you give me something too complicated than something oversimplified. Now, if it's overcomplicated, the average person may get it eight hours. I'll get it too. It might be 12, 14, two days, or three. But I'll get it if I can even sense that there's some real essence there. But if you oversimplify it, you leave it out. There's many subjects. I wouldn't know what you left it out. But in this subject we're talking about now, it certainly has been left out in our day. Now, I want to ask you folks a question. Why can't man reconcile himself to God? Now, I said I'm speaking on the atonement tonight. 
The atonement is a great subject, as you well know, but the word is only in the New Testament once. It's 75 times in the Old Testament. But the word is translated reconcile in the New Testament. There are many, many times. In fact, he says he has committed unto us the ministry of reconciliation. So I ask you a question. Why can't man reconcile himself to God? Now, I'm familiar somewhat with 17 different views on the atonement. Many of them contradict each other. Well, we often say, unless they can answer these two questions in their system of believing this, they do not deserve to be called a position or a view on the atonement. The first one is, why, can, why can't man Reconciling himself to God. And I can tell you he can't apart from Jesus Christ. Can't. And the second one is, get this. Why cannot God reconcile man to himself or to one another without the atonement of Christ? Even God can't do it without his son, the Lord Jesus. Let me tell you, if he had had any other way to do it than to go by that way, that brutal cross, you can rest assured the Father would have had him. Go that way. <coughs> I believe our great Heavenly Father did many, many hours of calculation and thinking. I admit he made this world in six days, and I haven't never in my life had any trouble with that. That's a matter of how big your God is. And I've known very, very closely some of the top scientists of this world, and I've worked with them. And I can tell you that none of them that I ever worked for, and I've had about 3,000 work for me, ever believed in evolution. Not a one of them. Because they didn't have the need to believe in evolution. I call evolution the, the pseudoscience of the pseudo-intellectuals. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't want to behave yourself in this world, if you don't love your fellow man, you don't want to do right, What's right? You better have evolution or you won't be able to sleep at night. But when any teacher ever taught that to my daughters in school, they got a visit from me. <laughs> or I invited them and their husband to come to our house for dinner. And I gave them a nice little lection, a lecture on apologetics, which they usually didn't understand. But they, didn't, they thought that most people that believe this blessed book only have a fourth grade education. Well, let me tell you something, dear friends. I know many of the best educated people in this world this day that love this blessed book and believe every word of it and want to, want to write it on their hearts and they live in it every day. Live in it. It's not just a piece of furniture. So, why can't God reconcile man to himself and to one another without the death of our Lord Jesus? Now, God's greatest problem was not in making this world and uh, putting it on a 23 and a half degree axis and starting it spinning 360 sometimes in a quarter every year. That wasn't his greatest problem. You know what his greatest problem was? <coughs> was how in his moral government, see, God is a moral governor of the universe. Most people don't want to think of him as a moral governor of the universe. Oh, they like to think of him as a man upstairs, whatever that means. That may be in the apartment above, for all I know, for some people. I'll tell you, when I witness to scientists, I tell them, I believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, maker of heaven and earth, father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's no doubt there, is there? And if I am supposed to be very meticulous in my work, I think we should be. And when we talk about our Savior, when we talk about the God that we believe in, not the God of monism, because he's in a tree. I don't know how a tree is going to help you. It doesn't help anybody. It doesn't even help itself many times. They die of their wounds. So his greatest problem was how can a righteous Moral governor, reconcile man to himself or to one another by the forgiveness of sin and the exercise of mercy and still be a righteous judge of moral government. Well, what's the problem? Well, 
the most delicate thing in all this world to administer. And if you've had many children, and my mama and daddy, thank goodness, had 11. I'm glad they didn't believe in abortion. I was number nine. <laughs> and my daddy loved children, and my mother did too. They're, I think they're the glory of a couple. But I'm so glad that they brought us into the world, not to send us to college, but so they could share themselves with us, and so they could share their love for us, and we could share our love with them, and we could react and respond to their love every hour of the day. And by the way, that's why God created man. He created man, not to glorify him. That would make God selfish. God created man to share himself with, and when man gets into the right condition and relationship with him, yes, he will glorify God, but that will become one of the effects. That's not the reason that he made us. If God made man to glorify him, that would make God selfish, and he sure got cheated in the deal, didn't he? If he did. But I don't think he did, and there isn't a verse in the Bible that tells me that he did. I know the Westminster Confession says that. Says a lot of other things too that I don't believe. But when I can't find it in the Bible, I don't believe it. You know, it's like this. I have a son and I had two daughters, and a lot of years in between the two. I'd come home from work, I'd go in the garage, I'd walk into the kitchen. My wife is sometimes preparing meals. <laughs> well, I'm gone so much. Like I told you about, the, about my daughters and how we would let our daughters pick where we we're going to eat at night. My daughter Nancy had all, she's 10 years old at the time. She had all the fancy places in town staked out. We got, they got to choose one once a month. She had steak and shake, <laughs> dog and such. <laughs> Those kind of places. Well, bless her little heart. That's, that was her idea of a feast, so we went there. But I th let me tell you what my idea of a feast was. I'd come home from work, give my wife a hug and a kiss in the kitchen, and walk on into the family room where the girls had the newspaper all apart on the floor. My daughter, Faith, is reading, seeing who's getting married and looking at the pictures. Nancy's reading a funny paper, and I just stand there. And they look up after a while, and they say, Daddy's home, Daddy's home. And they come running, and they do what we used to call track meet, the broad jump, now called the long jump. <laughs> and they straddle me right here like this, and hang on me from the side. Now, I was a little hard on my uh, back. But we would just stand there and have a little love session. I would kiss them and they would kiss me. That's why I like having girls, not boys. You don't have to stop kissing them. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I loved them and they loved me. And every night I put them to bed, I got down on my knees and I prayed with them and I thanked Jesus for them. And I, I thanked him for letting me be their father, but also to be a father that they could love and appreciate and look up to because I would tell the kids the relationship that we have with one another is supposed to be like unto that above, only that will be a hundred times better, won't it? And we owe that to our children, mom and daddy, to have that kind of a relationship with them, that they know that we love them and we appreciate them. And they're a big part of our life, not an appendage hooked on nor some trouble that we got to get some babysitter in to take them off our hands. Oh, I, babysitters have their place. But I had my children, not so I could send them to college. No, I wouldn't even send them away to private school. I, I couldn't be away from them that much. I didn't want to be one. Neither did my wife. Besides, we had missionary friends that needed that money. We had some preachers around our town. I'm 78 years old, friends, for you that are so fortunate not to know me. <laughs> and I, I'm still working for a living. I work five days a week. And I'm asked often, Harry, when are you going to quit working? 
I say, well, two ways. When my wife stopped going to shopping centers, <laughs> and when my missionary friends in far away and hard places, they left homes and houses and loved ones for the gospel's sake. When they don't need to eat anymore, then I'll, I won't be working anymore. But as long as I got breath, I'm going to work. I'm not going to the YMCA and play shuffleboard. <laughs> maybe, maybe the only job I'll do is some of my black preacher friends where I live let me preach for them. And they love to have me preach for them because they know I love them. I have so many of them that work for me. And one day, a big shot from the Navy, we had a Navy contract. They came in, a captain, said, well, according to Walsh Healy Act, Mr. Kahn, we're supposed to come in here, make a survey, affirmative action, and some of the other stuff. And we'd like to talk to your people and have the run of the place. I said, you can have it. But I said, I can save you a lot of, I can save you a lot of time. I'll take you over to see my black preacher friend, Reverend Joseph Turner. So we go over there and we go into his office. And I said, Brother Joe, this captain, so-and-so, and he's from the Navy to check us out on how we treat the minorities. And Joe, I'm going out that door. I'm going back to my office and you tell him that the truth, take the, all the varnish off of it. You don't have to answer to me. We both got to answer to God, don't we? I went up to my office. About 45 minutes later, that captain came up to me kind of grinning, like, like Joe might have hit him in the head with a board, you know. <laughs> but I knew Joe wouldn't do that. I said, you kind of look amused. Is there something I, I need to help you with? He said, oh, no, 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 I can leave here the next minute. He says, I never heard of a place like this in my life. I said, what do you mean? Do you know what that guy told me? I said, I have no idea. Crossed my heart, I hope that I, I, I didn't. He said, Captain, we got Christian men in this company, and we got quite a few of them. They weren't here when Mr. Khan came, but they are now. And we love one another. I brought all kinds of people here. I brought my Mexican friends. I brought my black friends. And there's never been one of them yet that he wouldn't give them a job. Now, about half of them didn't show up. But he says they know it. And they know it all over town. Here is a fair company that that man sitting up there, when he sits down, he wants that to be the kingdom of God in effect right there. Right there. And he, that man and I, to this day, were like this. He said, he didn't say this in a smart aleck way. He said, Captain, we don't need no Martin Luther King here. Well, it's sad to say many places did. But he said, we don't here. We get along great. In fact, as black preacher, Claiborne, Salter, Kong said, can I come and see you? I said, sure. He came in and he asked me a question. I wonder what you'd have said. He said, Mr. Khan, do you believe in being merciful? I said, brother, I better. Because <laughs> blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain what? Mercy. Uh, if you want God to forgive you, you must forgive your fellow man. And you must be a man that's disposed to forgive. Oh, I thank God for a mother that beat that into every one of us. <laughs> well, I had, I had a marvelous mother. I've told someone about here that we had a man and family in our end of town. I won't tell you their nationality, but uh, they like green. <laughs> and they had a son that was... He wasn't an idiot, and he wasn't retarded, but he was sure slow. I know the feeling. And the kids in our end of town are making fun of Johnny Rafferty. And my mother lined all of us up there, knew that thought she was a Marine Corps major. 
She says, I've been hearing about children making fun of and teasing poor Johnny Rafferty. Don't you know where to be kind to the fatherless, the fatherless and the feeble-minded? Don't you know that? Now, in case you didn't know it, you know it now. And if I even hear that one of you has teased him or done anything like that, I'll skin you alive. I thank God for a mother like that. She was no silly sentimentalist. And she meant exactly what she said. And yet she was as gentle and tender. And I had a relationship with the Lord that when, as I told someone here this week, I stood at a casket, January 10th, 1963, and people come, came up to me, leaned on my shoulder and told me, we were so poor, but your mama brought us clothes. She bought us food. She'd do that for weeks and then say, can I take your kitties to Sunday school? And after she got that, she'd start on us. And she gave us clothes and she gave us food and she cared for us. And then we started going to Sunday school and they'd say, Brother Harry, I wouldn't be in the kingdom of God today if it wasn't for your mama. As I say, there were so many of them came up and did it. You could have wrung the tears out of my suit. Did you ever hear about a woman like that? That's the kind of a mother I had. And she loved the poor and the sick and the downtrodden and the minorities. And, and let me tell you something, dear friend, she was as colorblind as possible to be. You know why? Because she walks with a colorblind fellow named Jesus. And we better do the same thing. Well, he came to die. But let me say this. Now, if you have stolen from someone, if you've injured someone, or if I have, any of us have insulted someone and we have a ruptured relationship with them, if we have done it, who should make the first move of reconciliation? The other person, the injured person, or we that have injured them? Would you answer that for yourself and for me tonight, right now? Who should make the first move? We should. But God commendeth his love in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God made the first move. I don't know about you, but sometimes I can sit in my office and bow my head and thank him for a precious truth like that. I should have been seeking him, but he sought me and he bought me. You see what I mean? Now it all starts with that one right there. Now, One day, Job asked Moses if he'd come up on Sinai. And uh, he went and talked to the elders. I'm sure it wasn't for <laughs> permission. But he told them of this invitation that Jehovah had given to him. And he said, he's asked me to come up there and he's going to give me some laws. What do you men think? This Deuteronomy 5.27, I'll quote it to you. Go thou near, Moses, and hear all that the Lord our God shall say unto thee, and we will hear it, and we will do it. Mind you, they didn't believe in inability. They believed that God was so right and so just and so reasonable. He'd never give them any laws to keep that they couldn't keep if they meant business and would live for one another and for him. You see, when Mo Moses came down from Sinai with the two tablets of stone, and here they had the golden calf up. Well, as you know, they were broken, had to go back again. But let me say this to you, dear friends. The Ten Commandments did not create our obligation to God and to one another. It merely defined what they always had been, and they always will be. And I believe when I see my mama, in glory, I'm going to love, honor, cherish her just the way I did down here because it was right, it was reasonable, it was intelligent, and that's what I was made for, to honor my mother and my father. That's a part of the reason God let me come upon this earth. 
The, the Jews, whatever the Israelites, whatever their faults were, they never pled inability to obey what God told them to, to do. They just didn't do it. But they didn't never say they couldn't do it. All right, we can't do it. In fact, Paul said, I preach that all the world might become guilty before God. Now, if man can't obey God, if he's born with some screwy thing in his nature that he can't, then man is pathetic, not guilty. He may be pathetically guilty, but the Bible doesn't say that. He says, I preach that all the world might become guilty before God. Until we do that and we see that, we never see our need for a Savior. Now, God doesn't take great delight in keeping us under great conviction like that for a long period of time. That's up to us how long it is. But he'll take that time, whatever it is. And he may say to you, and some of you friends, you better realize this tonight. The Spirit of God has been speaking to you this week. But you just can't say, go, go away, Spirit of God, come back another day. You keep on saying that, he'll do it, but he'll never come back because God says, my spirit shall not always strive with man. If you went with a young lady that you was in love with, and you asked her to marry you, and she said, well, I'll come back in 10 years. I will go together, but come back in 10 years. You go back in 10 years. And she said, I'll come back in five years. And pretty soon you're up there about 78 years old like me. <laughs> will you marry me? I don't think there'd be much marriage at that time. Listen, friends. Don't say no on the way, for now is the day of salvation. And I know I didn't get saved until I was two weeks shy, 31 years of age, and I wish I'd have got saved about 15 years sooner, or whenever it was necessary. Now, God gave us laws to keep. You never have laws without sanctions, friends. Law without sanctions are not laws, they're advice. That means that when God gave us a law, there are sanctions, which means penalties or consequences for obedience, good consequences. And there are penalties over here on the left side for disobedience. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Now, if we don't have penalties and consequences, then you don't have law, you just have advice. But I'm here to tell you the Ten Commandments are not ten pretty good old country suggestions. They are moral laws, and they're as much laws as any, as any physical laws that I ever studied, or any man ever has studied. And they're still in effect today. All right, then he says, I gave them to you for your good always. Never meant to be restrictive in, in the worst sense. Never meant to be burdensome. Never meant to be a legal thing that you've got to grind at it and like that. No, no. It's like I've said to you. It's like that yellow line that you see in the middle of the road as you're going up over a hill. The yellow is on your side. You look at that. You say, I'm going to stay on my side because that's for my good and for the people coming over the hill's good and those riding with me and those behind me. If you got the sense the good Lord made you with, you stay on your side of the road. Isn't that right? That's why he says, I give these laws to you for your good always. Now, man has broken God's laws. We've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. Well, most people, when they begin to do a little thinking, they want to get away from the consequences of that sin. But you know, when we choose an act, friend, there are two kinds of consequences connected to it primary consequence and a secondary that may go till the day we die. And if we don't find forgiveness with Christ, it'll hound us to the end of eternity, which has no end. Otherwise, when we choose an act, be it good or bad, we're also choosing the consequences connected to it. Make no mistake. All right, now, men, when they begin to think well, they want to have, they get some mercy and not have to pay for all these sins. And that's only intelligent not to want to suffer the consequences of all these sins, but uh, they're saying they're laws. 
and yet they want to be forgiven, they want to be pardoned. Now, I lived in New York or Chicago for 25 years before I moved to the town where I live now. There were people there that when they got arrested for breaking the law, they wanted to get out of it. And by the way, friends, I used to do a lot of work in the engineering of landing gears, like the B-47, the B-52, and I did the outriggers, and I did a lot of parts on there. Well, about 10 years afterwards, the fellow that I worked with, for this time, he's president of a fine corporation in Detroit. And he came through town. And he called me up from a motel at, on the edge of our town. He said, Harry, this is your friend, Hope. I said, Jack, where are you? He said, right here in town, the clock tower motel. He said, I'd like to see you. I said, well, come right on down or I'll come out. I'd like to have lunch with you. So he came down, he sat down. I said, how's your wife and your family? Jack, he said, well, my wife's wonderful, but my boy, he's all right now. I said, what do you mean now? You kind of emphasized that. He said, well, Harry, I was on the way to London, and I stopped at Sikorsky Aircraft up in uh, Stratford or Stanford, Connecticut. I think it's Stratford now. While I was there, I got a phone call from my wife telling me my son was in jail. So I forgot about going to England. I caught the plane to Detroit. When I got home, my son's out of jail. He's sitting at home. I went and I sat down with him. I said, son, tell me about it. Well, he said, Dad, I was stupid. I was with a bunch of roughnecks that I don't usually hang with. And I know you wouldn't like for me to. But we did a little drinking. We stole some hubcaps, and we did this, and we did that. And he's sorry. He said, I'm sorry I did it. Then you're guilty, right? Yes. He said, come on, son, get your hat and coat. He said, where are we going? He said, we're going downtown to see the police chief and the judge. Not looking for the best lawyer can get him out of it. If you get him out of it, you've contributed to his delinquency, haven't you? Now, what would the average parent do? Ready to mortgage everything they got to beat their rap, as we say nowadays. No, not, not right-thinking people do that. Oh, no, no. I know my mom and daddy wouldn't. They'd say, you take your medicine, you won't do it the next time. So they went down. Chief police got the judge. And when the judge came in, he shook hands. He knew the boy's dad. He said, well, uh, Jack, what is it you want? He said, Judge, my son was in jail here last night. And my wife called me. I came right home. He stole some hubcaps. He told him what he was going to do. And he said, Your Honor, what are we going to do to him? He said, what did you say? <laughs> what did you say? He's broken the law. He's stolen these things. He did this with his bunch of rough decks. I said, what are we going to do with him? I'm on the side of the law. He said, that's what I thought you said. He said to his son, the judge did. Son, do you say that you're guilty of doing what you're charged with? He said, yes, I am. He said, are you sorry? He said, sorry. He said, my dad has worked like a dog that I might go to school and I might live in a decent home. I got a wonderful mother and good brother and sister and here I'm in trouble with the law. She, Your Honor, I did it and I feel like the dumbest, stupidest jerk in this whole town. And whatever you decree for me, I'll do it. I'll do my time with no whimpering because I know my daddy's right and you're right. And I want to get on the right side of things. He said, well, son, if you'd brought come in as the high-powered lawyer, you're going to get out of this thing. You wouldn't have got out. I can tell you that. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do with you. You're really sorry you have done this? And then the boy, husky like young lady, began to weep. He said, I sure am. He said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you probation. 
But if I ever catch you in my court again, I don't care if it's stealing chickens. I'll give you 50 years. <laughs> but I'm letting you go now, not because of you, because your mom and daddy, they're on the law side. They're not on your side. They love you. I know they love you. But if they tried to get you out of this without suffering the penalty, that would not be love. Don't you wish all the parents in, in, in this country would take that approach to their kids? I know some of them in our town have been in jail so many times. I'm talking about white boys. I've seen where they beat this fellow up, they beat that fellow up, they've done this. I wonder what kind of a daddy and mother they've got because you know something? The children are usually a second edition of the parents. We had a real tough Sunday school class in our church. I usually taught in the winters in Switzerland, but the pastor asked me if I'd stay home that winter and help him. We have a pretty big set church, about 900 and some members. He said, would you take the 12th grade, please? He said, come down and set in some time. When I'm at, we're having Sunday school introductions and things. They don't sing the songs. They talk out loud. And when I'm teaching, they pay no attention. He said, Harry, will you teach him? I said, can I use my own material? <laughs> he said, yes. I said, then you tell those kids they got a former Marine Corps major <laughs> coming, and he doesn't take any foolishness. Oh, well, fine. First day, I'm teaching them. Two long tables, but from here back there to Frank down to Tully. And a girl back there is talking out loud to a girl up here in this row of table. I said, just a minute. Do you go to East High School? She said, yes. Do you mean to tell me that you act like that at East High School? You talk out loud when the professor is talking and talk to a girl way up here? You act like that? She didn't say anything. I said, you keep on acting like I didn't hear I think God will strike you dead. Because <laughs> you're going to learn. You're going to learn to respect the house of God and the people in it and the Sunday school classes. Now, if you folks are trying to make your mom and daddy look bad, you're sure doing a great job. I don't know most of your folks, but I sure know a lot about them by looking at you kids. Now, if you want to keep on making them look bad, you just keep on doing it. Now, by the way, I love those kids. I prayed for them every day. I tell you, I had them like that from September till May. And I gave them tests on moral government, on moral law, and things like that. And I'd give them $25 for the guy at the highest grade, 15 for the next, 5 for the next. If five of them tied, five of them got five bucks. You tell me something better to do with my money. Let me tell you something. By the end of May, they went to the head of the, of the Sunday school people, officers, and a fine, godly man said, look, we're supposed to go to the college and career class for the summer. So when we come home from college, we'll know people. Would you please let us stay with Mr. Khan this summer? Because the first time in our life, somebody's told us something other than Bible stories. He's teaching us. He's teaching us the atonement. He's taught us moral law. He has taught us the moral government of God. And we want it all summer, can we? Now, does that sound like I was too hard on? It's like my daughters. They're taught moral government. And a girl came to me and said to me, Mr. Kahn, do you know what your daughter, she was a sophomore in high school, she said, you know what your daughter says about you? Said, no. And I wasn't worried. She says that she hopes you die before she does because she knows if she died first, you'd die with a broken heart over her. Does that sound like I'm hard and I'm rigid and I'm burdensome? No, but I do not let the inmates run the asylum. <laughs> <laughs> See what I'm saying? All right, now then, if you've got law, you've got sanctions. And sanctions are rewards for obedience and penalties for disobedience. Whoa, we all want the good sanctions, but not enough 
to obey. So let me say this. Most of the people in this world, all they want from God is mercy. Now, if every time someone has broken law and you arrest them, you take them in front of a judge, a judge says, what do you plead? If they say, we, we plead guilty, and he says, all right, I'll have mercy on you, and he shows mercy on everyone. Mercy means to not give them what they deserve. Now, if he shows mercy to everyone, what does that do to your law? It destroyed. You can say that again. Well, but wait a minute. How about if you never show mercy? What do you think that does? How about if you never pardon? If we never pardon in the laws of land? I'll tell you, love would suffer because there are times, there are times when we should pardon people. We should pardon them. I'll give you an example. Here's a man done some terrible things in the way of robbery. And he's been sent up for 25 years. And he has four or five little children. He's put away in a pen, and he does 10 years of his time. He hadn't done enough to get parole. Now his wife's got cancer. Now, if we don't give that man a pardon so he can get home and help his wife and take care of his kids, love's going to suffer. Love is going to suffer. If you never show pardon or mercy, love will suffer. But if all you show is mercy, then you'll have no law. So what is the big problem God has in the moral government of God? He is to be able to reconcile mercy and justice. Well, how about if we show pardon often? And very, very frequent. What will happen to our system of law in our cities? Well, it certainly has happened. In the city of Chicago, when I moved out of there, it was common knowledge. If you got caught in a murder rap, that you could buy your way out of it for $700. Now we almost have a million people, a uh, thousand people that are murdered every, every year. Why? The law has lost its sanctions. And yes, they get mercy, but we don't have law anymore. And that law is for our good. Well, my friends, there's many times, and it's very prudent to show mercy, but ah, you have to weigh it very, very carefully. Just imagine, now, you can't hardly walk outside after dark in most large cities in the United States. How about if we showed mercy and we pardoned everybody today in our penal institutions? How do you think it would be? I know towns right now where people will not go outdoors after dark in certain areas. And I've just been talking about the reason for it. And one of the reasons is I know something about peniology, and that is if you want your peniology to have good results, you better make them more uncomfortable in the prisons than they are outside. Because <laughs> when it's outside and they're having trouble getting a job and flying straight, well, they'll throw a rock through it when there's something to get put in there. To get put in there because it's comfortable. They call it going home to mama. I was a president nine years for a company in Italy. Even over there, they even give them free prostitutes. And they talked to me about it. I said, you people don't seem to know anything about habilitation or re and rehabilitation. It's impossible to rehabilitate somebody that's never been habilitated in the first place. I'll tell you what you do. You go to nine Christian people, as you know, they're not here. Ask them, what does it mean to habilitate a person? They don't even know. I don't care who the chaplain is in a penitentiary. If you give him 900 men in there, men that had never been habilitated when they were young, Otherwise, never equipped how to live morally. Equipped how to live morally and to have how to work. Let's see you rehabilitate someone who's never been habilitated. Well, you better start right in there as they are. All right, now, I want to turn to the New Testament. I want to turn to Romans 3.
24th verse, and I'll read through the 26th. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, get this, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. That he might be just and the justifier. Now, friends, God has a moral government. We've been studying it this week, the moral government of God. We saw four distinct realms over which God governs. We saw the inanimate creation. We saw the animate non-moral. We saw the governmental providence. Then we saw the government of free moral action. But we also saw how God governs free moral agents. And he has this wonderful moral government of God, which is but another name for the phrase kingdom of God, and kingdom of God is a form of moral government, and the simplest form of moral government is the human family, isn't it? All right, now, but here's man, he sinned against God. You know what, the God, what God said about the Israelites? He said to them, you've gone astray so much after these false gods, you've gone a-whoring after false gods, I'm broken with your horse heart. I believe God wept over Israel. He said, I'm broken with your horse heart. Now, here's the moral governor of the universe. And there, so he could have destroyed them a hundred times in the Old Testament and been just. But he was merciful. Being that way didn't help them. All right, now they're separated from God. Now, there is such a thing, and he quotes it here. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Ah, now what do we mean by propitiation? Well, there are arrangements in abundance for the administration of justice, and there are arrangements for the exercise of mercy, but there are none for the blending of the two. You cannot blend mercy and justice. But God, he found a way to reconcile mercy and justice on Calvary's cross. So it would make it safe for him to show man mercy and uphold his justice at the same time. Now to the law, the atonement must relate to it. And to, I'm going to give you five things here it must relate to. To the law itself, that's a, its authority may be maintained. That's what's wrong today. The law has lost its authority. To the penalty of the law, that the object contemplated by the penalty may be secured. Penalty is to get people to obey the law for their own good and for the neighbor's good, isn't it? Third, to the offenders in whose behalf it is made, that it may make their reformation and good conduct assured. See, my friends, we all want to be forgiven. But you're going to come to God for forgiveness of sins in Christ Jesus. You're to come there for two things. For repentance from sin, faith to our Lord Jesus, and to submit for transformation. Now, if you don't want to be transformed by the grace of God, don't waste his time and your time either. Because he has no way to forgive a sinner without transforming him by his grace. Now, tomorrow morning, I, I intend to spend a whole time on how does he do that. All right, it must relate to the community that it may have nothing to apprehend if the guilty are pardoned. And it must relate to the character of the lawgiver, that that character may stand fair before the world, be such as to inspire confidence if the just penalty of the law has remitted. Now, you know in the Old Testament, our Jewish friends, they had a day of atonement, the Passover. And they were to take an unblemished lamb to the Levites, have them sacrifice it. By the way, in the Old Testament, the gospel was centripetal. That means it drew people into Jerusalem for the Passover. 
They didn't even have synagogues until after they returned from the <coughs> Babylonian captivity. But after that, they could go to the synagogues. Then after the day of Pentecost and six weeks thereafter, after the short-term Bible school was finished, then it became centrifugal. They went out to the ends of the world. But they had to be taught. They were well-meaning, some of those Jews, in, in a right relationship with God in the Old Testament sense of the word. Bless God, they came to the Passover and got in on Pentecost. <laughs> and it passed, let's say, from the Old Testament economy to new life in Jesus Christ. New life. And now they're going to teach him for about six weeks. And that was the best trained church that we ever had. <laughs> Only about six weeks, but look who they had to teach them. Eleven apostles and the blessed Holy Spirit. All right, now they're to, they're, they're to go out there and they're do, to do, they're to lead people to reconcile. But wait a minute, let's go back to the Jewish family. Now once a year, my friends, they were to take an unblemished lamb. That meant one that's not crippled, has no scars. He's a good lamb. He's, he's top quality. We don't take our second best to God. All right, now, here's the family and the daddy. They started with this one. as a little you about this big. And it was left in the house. It was like a pet. And, and the, it was a pet. We had a dog one time named Pompey, a little French poodle. My wife and daughters talked sweeter to that dog than they ever did to me. <laughs> <laughs> but he was sweeter than I am. <laughs> but how they loved that little dog. When that dog died, Rocco, they cried for three days. <laughs> well, that lamb that the Jews would take his little one here and start raising it, and it was raised like a child. And then when it came the day of the Passover, the daddy picked it up, and the mama and her kids went walking toward the synagogue, and they're carrying it, and the kids are crying. They are crying. They know that little lamb's going to get his throat cut. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Isn't that right? And they knew that was an innocent little lamb. We know another lamb that was innocent, don't we? In whom was no sin ever found. But that's, that was a type of what was going to come one day on Calvary. And John the Baptist recognized him when he walked to him. He said, Be home. Behold, the Lamb of God, not a Lamb, the Lamb. There's an article there that takes away the sin of the world. Now, let me tell you, if they were sick, also, they could do this. And if they were very poor, they could buy two turtle doves. And they'd take these to the priests, but they would go to running water. And they'd cut the throat of one, and they'd let the other one fly away, bearing away our, their sins. Bearing away their sins. But they took this other one, and they cut his throat, the turtle up. It only cost a penny. Now they took that blood on their fingers, and they anointed the right thumb. And they anointed the lobe of the right ear and the right big toe. You know what that's symbolic of? The thumb, you're going to work for the night's coming when no man can work or don't sacrifice it. Here, you're going to hear the word of God. You're going to hear the preaching of the word, the reading of the word. You're going to give attention and first place in your life to the things of the spirit. And the big toe, you're going to walk the life of faith because there's only one life soon going to be passed. It's the only place we can walk the life of faith. And let me tell you something. If they want to be prayed for, if they were not willing to have their right thumb anointed, their ears anointed, they're going to hear the word of God and they're going to obey. <coughs> they're going to walk the life of faith. God was not willing, the Levites are not willing to pray that they be healed. Now you see the typology that there was back there. Now here's the Lamb of God. Here's the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus. God has no way to forgive sins but by blood. It isn't that he took, that he took great pleasure in blood. Of course he did. And it's not a slaughterhouse religion. 
Now, we read the word here, propitiation, which means to be propitious is to be disposed to forgiveness and favor when Jesus died. Now, don't get me wrong. It did not render God merciful. He always was merciful. But what it did, it made him to become as the moral governor of the universe. This is something different now. Not just as a position, but as the moral governor of the universe. Now he's got to be a righteous judge and treat them all alike, doesn't he? And he's got to have a way Forgive them breaking his law, but to uphold his justice at the same time. Well, in our courts, if we show all mercy, then our law caves in. If we show all justice, love suffers, and boy, we're going to be very rigid. And that isn't right either, because there are occasions when a man or a woman or a young person should be pardoned or be merciful too. Now then... How is God going to be merciful? And you know, as you sang tonight, that blessed old hymn, on a hill far away, the rugged cross, you know, where he says, and they put the words of Jesus where he says, where I, where I suffered and sanctified you. You know what sanctifies means? It means it's set apart for a holy use. Now, when you come to his cross for forgiveness, don't you dare just come for forgiveness. You come to present yourself. You're going to live for him now, and you're going to live a sanctified life. You're not going to be a whirling that every time the Phillies play and every time the Flyers play and all this other junk that you can run around to the world to. No, you're going to be drinking at a different fountain. Am I right, Teresa? And you couldn't care less whether they got how many lost string or how many wind string and all that. Because we're drinking at a different fountain now. And we've lived in a sanctified, holy life. Not to get to heaven, but because Jesus deserved to be served and deserved to be obeyed. And God, by virtue of who he is and what he is, deserves first place in our life. And we want going to live a holy life to bring joy to his heart. Because I read in my Bible that sin makes God sad. When your kids misbehave, how does it affect you? You sure don't go out and cheer them up, do you? No, no. I, I'm sorry to tell you. When I was 16 years old, I made my mother weep for my sin. And when I heard she crying and telling God, dear Lord, I didn't raise my boy like that. Do you think that made sin a cheap thing to me and I'd go right out and do it again? Brother Rocco, I decided right then and there I'd never do anything that would ever discredit my God, my mother, my Savior, or my, that good daddy that I had. Because why? I had a mother wept over my sins, wept over them. Most people today don't have a mother like that. Now, let me say it again. When Jesus died, he says, it says right here, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. Now, what does it mean? To be propitious is to, to be disposed to forgiveness and favor. To push, propitiate is to render an aggrieved or an offended party clement and forgiving. Is that whereby the favorable change is wrought God is propitious to sinners in a disposition toward forgiveness. For he says, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and to their sins. I will remember no more because of what Jesus did to reconcile mercy and justice. And so that the Holy Spirit of God will make it real to these people. That wait a minute. These sins, these sins were the reason my son had to die. As a governmental expediency. Moral government of God expediency. And expediency means profitable for the moral government of God. So, I read now in my Bible. I go back to Luke. And I want to read Luke 24. And I'll be finished. I know it's getting late, friends. Luke 24, 46, 47. And said unto him, well, I'll start in the 45th verse. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures. 
Oh, I would he do that to everybody here tonight. And said unto them, Thus it is written, Thus it behoove Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Why? Because the same person here went to Calvary's cross. He became our sin bearer there. Now, let me say this to you, friends. Jesus was a substituted sufferer who should have suffered for their sins. We. But he suffered for our sins. So he was a substituted sufferer. All right, now then, we find that what he suffered was a substituted suffering. It wasn't the same suffering that a man would suffer if he goes to hell. It was just that which was necessary to meet the ends, uphold the moral government of God, so they could see that God was not winking and saying that this was a very, very important thing. So that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, because it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and in the moral government of God, it made so a just and a holy God could show you and me mercy and uphold his justice. Now, in one illustration, you'll see this. See what the man couldn't do is Darius. Now, maybe you pronounce it Darius. From 7th, 8th chapter of the book of Daniel. Daniel was a Hebrew young man. A strong drink, never touched his lips. I tell you, he was one of those fellows back there. There's four of them. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. But Daniel was busy somewhere else that day, or he'd been with him. He come out. He would have come out not smelling like a fire either. <laughs> what a young man! All right, now he winds up over there in captivity, and he's in a right relationship with God, no matter where he is. And the spirit of God was upon him. He had great wisdom, didn't he? And he had great favor with the king. All right, now the Gentiles are very jealous of Daniel. So what do they do? They get apart, apart from Darius, and they cook up a phony law there. It's a law. And the law is that you cannot ask anything from any king or any god. You can't pray to them for the next 30 days. If you do, the laws and the Medes and the Persians is going to put you in the lion's den, and you will then become a Daniel Burger. <laughs> <laughs> well, they said, you know, it says that children of this generation are wiser than the children of light. It's a sad and sorry thing, Jesus said. How they use their minds to think, but we don't. Well, what they were thinking behind this was, we got this law. Now, the laws and Medes and the Persians says there's no exception. When a man breaks the law of the Medes and the Persians, he suffers for it. And whatever the penalty is, that's what he gets. The penalty of this is to go to the lion's den. Is that right? Or am I quoting you Shakespeare? Ah, <laughs> oh, this is just a great story. It has everything to do with the atonement. So, oh, we got Daniel. Now, we got him between a rock and a hard place. If he prays, he goes to the lion's den. If he doesn't pray, he loses power with his God. He'll no longer be the top man of these three presidents that all of them are so jealous of him. But you know, the difference between a jackass and a real thoroughbred is when the going gets tough, he hit one, and the thoroughbred gives you everything he's got, and the jackass kicks back. <laughs> <laughs> That's the real difference. So what does he do? He's, it's against the law to pray. Bless God, he went home and he opened that window like he always did, and he prayed toward Jerusalem. And I think Gil, he had his hands over the head, over his head. And he's no secret service here. You know, most people think they're a charter member of God's secret service. <laughs> I got news for you, friends. God doesn't have a secret service. Those are deserters. And they usually shoot deserters during the war. There's no secret service in God's army. Well, he gets down, he prays. Here they are. They're out there listening. Ah, oh, we got him. 
We got him. See him up there breaking the law? You know what he's doing? He's thanking God for the mess he's in. <laughs> you know, if you never don't have any battles, you never have any victories. And you go out on the limb for God, and you obey him rather than obey the laws of the land when they conflict. Well, they run right over to Darius, the king. Hey, your little boy Blue, the prime minister, the president. We got him over here breaking the law, and we've arrested him. We got him down the crossbar hotel. <laughs> <laughs> so they bring him to, Dan to Darius. And he loved Daniel. Daniel was a very lovable man. The grace of God was upon him. And this intelligent king had enough sense to know it. And it says he labored till the going down of the sun as to how he might deliver Daniel, but he found a way. Now, what was the problem? If he lets the top man in his kingdom to break the law with impunity, that means with no penalty, then everybody in the whole kingdom will start breaking the law. But the further up you are in government, the more responsible you are. God said, to whom little is given, little shall be what? Required. Whom much is given, much should be required. We had a man who was president here for about a year one time. He didn't get to be president because the man that he got it from deserved to go to jail. Richard Nixon, and I'm a Republican, but that's where he belonged, especially with all that cursing and swearing, which he did. But also, had how he had broken the law, he withheld truths, he did everything. So here's a man we make president. You know what he did? He did it on the basis that he wouldn't let him go through litigation, wouldn't be arrested. Since when is a president of the United States above the law? Jerry Ford showed right there he didn't have what it took to be a, a righteous president of the United States. So all he got out was one year and a great big pension. All right, now, here's Daniel. They've arrested him. He's broken the law. Here's the problem. If you let Daniel break the law with impunity, that means without penalty, then your whole system begins to cave down, cave in. All right, now what is the problem? The problem is, if we're going to show him mercy, we gotta come up with a substitute for the penalty that'll have the same effect upon the law that the execution of the penalty upon a lawbreaker would have had. There was a problem. You know, if he'd have figured that out, what Darius would have had to do? He'd have had to go to the lion's den for him. That's what Jesus did for you and me. That's what he had to do. Now, he loved Daniel, but not that much. <laughs> <laughs> ah, but bless God, Jesus did. He, he loves unto death. He loved unto death. Now, let me say it again. It's the same problem that God has with each one of us here tonight. If God is, if you're not going to be penalized, if you're not going to suffer the penalty for your sins, then what's he going to do with these governments? What's he going to do? How is he going to come up with a substitute for the penalty? Well, he had a son. But if he's going to do it for you and for me, it is all based upon faith in that shed blood. Faith in faith. Faith that he died for us, but faith that it's also for salvation. And when we put our faith in the shed blood of Jesus, here's a wonderful thing. You don't have to understand everything about the atonement to get its benefits. But you do have to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ that he shed his blood on Calvary for you and me so a just and a holy God could be merciful and be just at the same time and uphold his moral government because of what his son Jesus did over here to uphold it. Because if he's going to forgive... King Darius is going to forgive Daniel. He's got to come up with a substitute for the penalty that he would have put on Daniel that would have the same effect upon the law that the execution of the penalty upon the lawbreaker would have had if he didn't want to destroy it. He couldn't figure it out, but bless God, our God did. Our God, he did. And you know what the answer was? God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. He didn't pay, he gave. 
He didn't pay. Gay. Gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And Jesus made all of that possible by going to Calvary. So, I just sum it up in short words. Christ's sufferings are as a substitute for penalty, not as the punishment of the sin judicially inflicted upon Christ, but in such a rectorial relation. Now, rectorial means to rectify, and to rectify us morally, and to rectify his moral government. So it makes him safe, it makes it safe for him to forgive us. He's not turning loose, the guy's gonna go out and do it all over again. Because now he's been to Calvary, and he's had his rebellious heart over our beloved Jesus, and now he does it because out of appreciation and gratitude to Jesus, if there were no hell to shun or any to gain. But in such a rectorial relation to justice and law as to render them a truly and true sufficient ground of forgiveness, that he might be just and a justifier, and that he's now propitious. And he says, I've got a way to forgive you, but you've got to come by the way of Jesus. You've got to come by the way of Jesus because he's the one that died for you. There is no other way. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none under the name given among men under heaven, whereby we must be saved because there's none other man that died there on Calvary for us. And we must put our faith, our trust in what he did there. And that is the only hope we got, but we present ourselves a living sacrifice to him in salvation to come and do with us as seemeth right, but cleanse us from our sin and transform us, dear Lord, by your grace. That's what that dear old woman who wrote the Battle of Him of the Republic when Mame Carly played every night to have me down here crying. And they played the Battle of Him of the Republic, those words of that third verse. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea. In the beauty of the lilies, that's moral purity, the lilies, symbolical moral purity. Born across the sea, and moral purity is the Joseph and Mary there. Oh, what a heredity that was. The best since Adam and Eve. The best. But the glory in his bosom, that means the intimate presence, to live in his intimate presence every hour of every day that transfigures you and me. Oh, that dear woman who wrote the battle of him, she knew our Savior. She knew him not only theologically, but she knew him by experience. Just think of those words. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with the glory is in his bosom that transfigures you and me. And you have it also, many of the good old hymns of the church. I hear it around here quite often when I'm about, take up your cross and follow me. Yes. Dear Father, we thank thee that Jesus died. We thank you that you gave him to die for us. Help us, dear God, to understand this greatest fact of all history. May it become the number one fact in everybody's life here. And out of gratitude to you, Lord Jesus, for dying, we want to live holy and good lives and be real value to our fellow man, to your blessed kingdom, in which we joyfully labor for thee, dear God. And we thank you now for this place and for every person here. And we thank you, dear Jesus, for such a gospel. If you hadn't died, we'd have no gospel to preach. Thank you, dear Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.